quite <laughs> as um, as brutal as the Papan sisters' case, but I do think that there are things that are looming right now. Well, I tend to agree. I think there are enough crimes going on out there where men are killing their their wives and their children, and children are killing children, and they're, people are being put into a situation that they're not used to. They've never had to deal with some of the things that we're having to deal with today. And I think people mm -hmm. are snapping. I think people are cracking at the seams. But this book really kind of brings that emotion to a head. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, something that um, is worth keeping in mind about that time period as well is that France was going through its own uh, Great Depression because it was feeling the reverberations of, you know, our depression coming out of the U.S. and mm -hmm. their economy was similarly uh, faltering. And so, you know, these kind of pushing out the girls, um, making sure that they, you know, had steady employment in order to support their family, in order to support themselves and each other. You know, that sort of tension is uh, something that I'm I'm definitely feeling right now, you know, here in the U.S., here in New York. It feels like uh, people are really starting to get desperate and people are starting to become really afraid of, of themselves and, and the lengths that they're going to have to go to to make things work. So, yeah, I, I think there's a current of that all around right now. It, it's very interesting how history is repeating itself as far as the economic situation, the general mood of the population, and everyone's desire to fix something that can't be fixed at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, it feels like there's, you know, a, a spiritual dearth in the world right now, and, and we're kind of, um, we're all going through this, this subconscious turmoil, um, trying to, you know, Stay safe uh, against the virus, uh, stay safe against, you know, uh, evictions, uh, losing health insurance, um, you know, losing wages, um, not being able to collect unemployment. You know, there, there are so many things that, you know, face just the average U.S. citizen right now that, you know, you don't even necessarily have to be a part of the, the gig economy. You don't even necessarily have to be, you know, a, a service worker, a domestic worker to feel all of these things. There's something very intimate about being a domestic worker as well, too, that I, I think lent that brutality to the Papan sisters' crime where, you know, they were, to a certain extent, a, a part of the family, you know, because they were such a part of their daily lives, of, you know, their domestic lives, but they weren't really seen as human. I mean, let alone seen as equal. They were kind of seen as something subhuman. And so, yeah, I, I think that those feelings are are out in the world right now, you know, when, when we're kind of told, hey, go back to work, even though there's no vaccine, uh, you know, you have to make those wages, you're not going to get unemployment. I think that that same sort of sentiment is resonating right now. And it's, it's a very dangerous one. Well, I think because of that, people's lives are in danger, because I don't think they realize the uh, people are feeling like they have no choice, they have no options. It's like the mm -hmm. options have been taken away from them. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's a very dangerous uh, position to put another human being in. You know, um, it, it's one thing to have a working experience where, you know, you feel degraded, you feel sort of under the heel. And it's another thing to have that same working experience, but you're not getting your wages, uh, you're not really getting any respect, you're not getting, you know, anything that would really improve the course of your life in a way that feels stable and reliable. That's really a recipe for, for unrest. And, uh, you know, depending on the situation, it could be something that's really explosive, lies in the, the pan sisters' crimes, or it could be something, you know, something else that's completely unprecedented. So, yeah, I, I agree. There, there are a lot of things to kind of uh, be mindful of right now to the best of our ability. Yeah, the book itself actually has a lot more power to it than you would think because you have to look at this as not just a history lesson. There's a lot more to mm -hmm. this story than, uh, you know, meets the eye just on the, the initial reading. Uh, my curiosity, though, is why did you feel that this would go over well as a comic or the way that it's illustrated? Mm hmm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a cartoonist. This is my fifth uh, graphic novel. 
And I've been working in comics for so long and I just, I love them so much. You know, that's how I choose to write. And so when I, you know, get interested in a story, uh, kind of the first thing that I start to envision is it as a comic. And I think this story in particular has a lot of, had a lot of potential because there were a lot of opportunities to show just how monotonous their lives were, you know, to, to give you pages and pages of, of them kind of doing domestic tasks and that sort of boredom and, and that sort of um, monotony. And, and I just thought, you know, this would be really, this would be something that would be really great. Of course, that's a lot of drawing. <laughs> you yes, have to, it is. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to think about all those chores. It's another thing to draw all of them. But that felt like a good way to, to present it. You know, and and even if you as a reader get kind of stuck on those pages and you're like, oh, these are really boring. It's like, well, you know, that's that's the point. Right. So. So, yeah, I, I always thought of it as a comic because, you know, I'm a cartoonist and, and that's how I think of everything. Well, I think it's a great way to get people's attention because there are people that prefer not to delve into the intense literacy that we have available but sometimes a comic is just as powerful as the Pride and Prejudice, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. because you're yeah. lo- you're looking at an illustration, you're reading the words, but you're also comprehending there's a, a, a pattern. It's almost like a storyboard for a movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, because you have to you have to follow along. You know, you have to read all of the text, all of the word balloons, you have to understand uh, the actions, the motions that are going on in the panel. You know, it, it definitely has a little bit more of an opportunity for like an active reader experience, mm-hmm. right? Because it's it's not just prose where you have to put everything together in your head. Uh, you can actually follow along and, and see kind of just how, how brutal the crimes were, uh, just how they were treated, you know, maybe get a visual experience of, the way that they look, you know, you can kind of get an idea of how they're feeling. So, yeah, I, I really like doing comics that, you know, have that potential for for dynamic storytelling like that. Well, we're getting uh, toward the end of our uh, interview here. What, what do you feel that, if you could leave our listeners with anything, what would it be? Hmm. Um, well, <laughs> you know, the book comes out next Tuesday, so I hope that they will buy it. <laughs> that is what I would love to leave them with. Um, but, but in terms of, of uh, sort of a more overarching mes- message, excuse me, um, you know, I, I do hope that if you're not someone who necessarily reads comics all the time, uh, I, I hope that people will give Maze a chance because, I think that, you know, we have so many different uh, adaptations of the Papan sisters story. You know, we have uh, plays, we have, you know, uh, kind of serious intellectual academic essays about them. We have a lot of films about them. But, you know, I believe that this is the first time that it's been in comic form. And so I hope that if people are new to the case, they will, you know, read the comic and, and kind of find it on a different level than if they had watched a film about it or even just read the Wikipedia page about it. And I hope that it will stay with them. And I hope that, you know, they'll think about things like wages, labor, you know, worker safety, mental health. There's a lot there, but I, I mostly just hope that they'll, they'll give it a chance. And where can they find your book? They can find my book uh, through my publisher, which is Fanographics. Uh, you can find them on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I believe the site is just fanographics.com. And, yeah, or you can also order it um, through, I believe, Amazon or through your local comic book shop. That is awesome. We'd like to thank our guest today, Katie Skelly. And thank you for the information that you've given us about this book. And, folks, remember, this is not a uh, trade rag comic book. This is a hardback book and it's nice um it, it's beautifully illustrated and i i think it's something that would make a very interesting piece to anyone's collection literally so i hope that you'll join us next time for another interesting interview with another interesting author and we thank our guest katie again today hope you'll come back next time <laughs>